meeting of the Personnel and Animal Welfare Committee to order. And we are going to start with item number four. Okay. Item number four, motion, Wesson Marti Martinez, Corrett O'Farrell, relative to the status of sexual harassment, ethics, and workplace violence training for all city employees, and proposed revisions to the training requirements for city employees and statement of economic interest. SEI Form 700 filers. Uh, this matter has also been referred to the Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Phyllis Lyons, uh, Assistant General Manager, Personnel Department. Raylan Napper, Personnel Department. So do you want to walk us through this? Uh... We thought you were going to walk us through this. Um, we intend to come back with a written report. Um, but up to this point, we have been looking into the possibility um, of giving training to 30,000 employees in some instances, 10,000 10, in other instances. And um, logistically, it's complicated. We're trying to see how we can work that out. Um, in addition to that, there are some funding issues as well. And we want to come back with all that information for you. Okay. I know... Uh... Uh, when I was in the state legislature, the legislators themselves had in-person training um, as a group. So uh, we were sure that everybody got all the information. Um, I don't recall whether we did anything this dramatic uh, to the whole group of, of employees. And I don't know what the logistical difficulties potentially are. Uh, have you been thinking that through yet or are you still too early in the process? We've been thinking that through when the requirement first came from the state to do this for all of our employees. That's when we first um, initiated uh, online training because of the complications with the city as large as, as ours is and, and the geographic diversity that we have to contend with and the cost of bringing employees uh, to a central area location uh, for the training or us training small groups of people. Um, so we're still wrestling with that, that issue. Um, we also, it, as it relates to workplace violence training, we, we had identified ourselves the need to train all employees. It was a number of years ago that we had uh, substantial funding to train all of our supervisors and managers. And we did that, but that was back in 2007, 2008. And we have been addressing uh, particular areas where there are concerns and uh, uh, training supervisors and managers, but the funding for that is no longer exists either. So what we did do is develop an online training course for workplace violence most recently because we felt this is information that all of our employees need to have. Um, so the, the thought of doing one-on-one -on -one training, as I said, we're still wrestling with some of the logistical issues and funding issues. Are there different types of in-person training for in these areas? Or is it just one type that typically is, is used? Uh, different types. Um, when we had um, uh, classroom training for uh, supervisors and managers, um, it was uh, there was a certain uh, certain topics that were covered. But in addition to that, it was somewhat customized for the particular um, organization that that we were going into. Um, and we did have consultants that did this training. And these consultants still work with us, but uh, more on an intervention basis as we see problems in the workforce. The training piece, we, they have not done consistently across the city in a number of years. And how long is a typical training session? Well, I know one that was done by an HR professional and a city attorney this morning was only 30 minutes, but it was for very high-level managers in sanitation. Um, they have been as long as a full day depending on the needs of a particular organization, and as, and as little as a half a day or a couple of hours. I was going to say 30 minutes doesn't sound like that would necessarily it was at do the, the job. Right. It was at the director, assistant director level. And that okay. was what was requested. But normally it's it's two to four hour type of training. That sounds more, more on, on target. Mr. O'Farrell, anything you'd like to ask? Just when you come back, if you could include in the report a measurement of how LA does uh, in comparison to other cities of a similar size. Well, there aren't that many, but <laughs> other major cities. Right. And then, is do you? How often do we evaluate the current procedure in terms of uh, its effectiveness? Is there a, a mechanism to do that other than just we train every year? I'm trying to think. Do we have a survey at the end of this particular training to capture at least the participants? 
um, reaction? Uh, this this particular training we don't uh, at the moment, but what we are um, had plan to do very soon is put a survey at the end of every course on the online training academy. And I would, I would like you to explore the possibility of, of combining the online training that you do with some personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, training, what that would look like, um, just, uh, just for further emphasis. I think that might be something to consider. For every city employee? Not necessarily. You know, maybe, maybe for uh, upper management, maybe for elected officials. Okay. Uh, explore what that would look like. Different options, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned 30,000. Uh, well, in the motion, I believe it said every employee, which okay, so. full-time employees would be 45. 40, yeah, okay. even oh, more. 45. Just wow. 45. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's an easy task. Come on. We have one trainer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> uh, we have one speaker from the public, uh, Andrew Westall from uh, Council President Herb Weston's office. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, Andrew Westall, Assistant Chief Deputy with City Council President Herb Wesson. Uh, Council President Wesson and Council Member Martinez uh, were very interested in introducing this motion. Uh, in the research that uh, our office had done, uh, there was no history or, or nothing out there through the cursory review that we did that there had been ever been a comprehensive review of the training programs and the requirements uh, that the city had in these three areas in sexual harassment workplace uh, violence and ethics. And so we, I think it's important before we move forward with changing anything that we do that review because I think it's imp very important that we have that information and we know uh, what's been done because it, at least it appears in the council file and in the other documents that we're able to find that there has been no, no review ever done. Uh, you also have a, a variety of council members that came from the state legislature, a lot of staff they used to work for the state legislature. Even myself, I worked for the legislature for seven years and have worked for the city now for almost eight. Um, and they have uh, very good training programs in the state legislature in these three areas. And so we also wanted to uh, have the personnel department do a review of that as well. Um, and so we can compare and, and contrast what the city and the state are doing in these areas. Um, and so we really wanted to move forward with those two pieces and have the motion held in committee until we got those report backs and hopefully could hear that in committee in early January. Uh, I think it's also important that we uh, we really look at doing this in-person training because we feel that it has a different effect than uh, online or video training and video education programs. And so even though there's a resource cost associated with that, I think it also helps us on the litigation side uh, help us minimize that risk. Uh, just to give you an idea, just in the sexual harassment area, there are five outstanding lawsuits against the city uh, just in sexual harassment. And of course, we know workplace violence takes its toll uh, not only uh, in human resources, but also financially. Um, and of course, ethics um, is another area which is very important. Uh, I think it's also important to understand, that, at least on the ethics side, that uh, we have made a lot of revisions to the campaign finance or, or, uh, ordinance and laws of the city over the last couple of years. We're making major revisions to the ethics ordinance of the city. And so people need to be trained in how these laws have changed over time. Uh, and really, uh, once again, getting back to that state legislature uh, comparison, how they're different from the state legislature. Because they, we do have different laws. They are more strict of uh, the state law in some areas, and so it's important that people know those differences. Um, and so with that, we would just ask that this motion be held in committee and that we get those report backs and, and hopefully have them heard in committee in, in sometime in January. So uh, we will move to do that without objection and uh, uh, add in uh, any of the uh, direction from uh, Mr. O'Farrell as part of that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Item number one. Item number one, personnel department report relative to proposed fourth and fifth year contract extensions with Mercer Consulting, AON Consulting, Standard Life Insurance Company, Standard Disability Insurance, and Talks Corporation from January 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2015. Um, this matter is a time limit filed with an expiration date of November 26, 2013. 
Well, welcome, and I'd ask you to uh, walk us through uh, briefly what each of these contracts uh, does. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Vasquez. I'm with the Personnel Department. Uh, this report is requesting City Council authority to allow the Personnel Department General Manager to execute a fourth and fifth year contract extension for the following contracts. For um, Mercer um, Benefits and Communication Consulting, for Aon um, Consulting, these two consultants provide um, assistance to uh, the personnel department and to the Joint Labor Management Committee that oversees the Civilian Flex um, Benefits Program. Um, in addition, uh, we're also asking for an extension of the standard disability insurance um, provider um, and standard life insurance. Uh, standard provides uh, these two life insurance be benefits to civilian employees. Um, in addition, we're also asking for an extension of the TALC's third-party administrator um, contract, and this third-party administrator um, uh, 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 administers our unemployment insurance um, claims. Um, I can provide you more detail, but just for background on the contracts involving um, the Civilian Flex Benefits Program, um, that program is also um, overseen by the Joint Labor Management Committee. Um, the the uh, committee uh, considered um, staff's recommendations to ex extend these um, contracts, and um, they voted to um, uh, concur with staff's recommendation um, regarding the contract extensions. Um, the proposed contract extensions um, do not involve any new expenditures from the general fund, um, so there is no, um, no impact in, in that regard. And in addition, the consulting contracts are also funded by the Flex Benefits Trust Fund, so there's no um, general fund impact on, on those two contracts. So how many companies responded to the uh, RFP issued for the current contracts? For which contracts? I'm sorry. For for all of them. Um, so there, each of them had its own RFP process, and for example, with the standard on the disability, um, there were four responders to that particular RFP that was done in 2010, and for the uh, life insurance, we had six companies respond to the RFP. I should also add that when this. Um, when the proposal to extend these contracts for the fourth and fifth year were reviewed, we take into consideration whether or not it's feasible um, to go out to RFP, whether the rates that were being offered are competitive, and it was determined that, that the rates we currently have are competitive. Um, and um, because these contracts, um, especially with the life and disability, um, involved um, quite a, they're, um, it's quite complex to change out a provider, we normally um, do extend contracts once we get um, council authority for the fourth and fifth year. And when uh, uh, the 2016 RFP goes out uh, and the providers are selected, does it come to council for approval? Um, normally, if the contract um, is for three years, it doesn't come to council. Um, and um, it, when we... Uh, if the general NBC um, opts to um, recommend to, in a contract extension, then those do come to council. Okay. Mr. O'Farrell, any questions? I, I do not. Thank you. So we will uh, approve the contract extensions without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Item number two. Item number two, Department of Disability reports relative to a new term of exemption slash re-exemption of one management analyst one for the AIDS coordinator office pursuant to charter section 1001D4, formerly council file number 04-1505. Subsequent to the release of the agenda, a um, additional report, an additional report was received from the Department of Disability um, that's been added to the file. Welcome. Hi. Good, good afternoon. Uh, Tony Abram, Department of Disability. Uh, we have 16 positions uh, with the Department of Disability, three major programs. One of those major programs is the AIDS Coordination Office. Uh, because of the importance of the level of expertise they bring when it comes to the prevention and treatment of HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, as well as uh, STDs, uh, we like to try to uh, have the position exempt in order to get that high level of expertise. And for that reason, the, person, the position has always been exempt. Therefore, we're asking for a new term of exemption. OK. 
Okay, and and this is funded by uh, CDBG funds. By CDBG. But the city has to front the funding, right? They certainly do. When do we get the money from the federal government, or when do we expect it? Yeah, that processing is through uh, CDD, where we go about billing them, and well, it's, it's done on a quarterly basis. And that may just be a quarterly basis between us and CDD. It may be an issue of even expediting it, doing it on a monthly basis. Okay. Mr. O'Farrell, any questions? I, I don't. Okay. So, uh, again, we will uh, approve the re-exemption without objections. Um, thank you. And the last item is item number three. Item number three, Joint City Clerk and Information Technology Agency report relative to instituting live remote virtual testimony and webcasting during council committee meetings to include instituting a pilot program. This matter was considered by the Information Technology and General Services Committee on October 8, 2013. It has also been referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Good afternoon. Holly Walcott, Interim City Clerk. I will also add that it has also subsequently been referred to the Rules Committee. Um, this city clerk and ITA did a uh, joint report to the ITGS committee um, basically stating what the options were for providing remote testimony, um, what we're recommending that if the city council wants to go in that direction that we utilize Google Hangouts because it is a product solution that the city already has in its arsenal and that it would not cost anything to have anything on the software side. There would be um, some cost on the hardware side that um, Mark can talk about. Um, but also the, if the council wanted to go in that direction, there would also be um, two uh, part-time staff required, which is why it was referred to personnel committee. But basically the uh, the Google Hangout solution is a video conferencing solution that would allow people in remote locations, uh, whether it be expert uh, testimony or the public, to um, remote into a meeting and provide testimony. So what, we, what our report recommends is that if the council wants to go in this direction, that uh, it be up to each chair of each committee, um, whether they wanted to um, utilize this or not, and it would, at this point at least, for logistical reasons, be available on the 10th floor. I'll turn it over to Mark. Any other info that we should have? Uh, good afternoon. Mark Wolf, Executive Officer with ITA. Um, as Holly's indicated, we've worked out a proposed process uh, if the city were to implement this type of technology for providing remote testimony to council committees. The funding uh, for putting in place the equipment uh, to be able to equip each of the committee rooms, which would be a total of five committee rooms on this floor, with the necessary equipment to do this would be approximately uh, $34,000. And that is a, an amount that can be absorbed within ITA's current year um, budget. In regards to staffing, for each committee meeting that would utilize this type of service, there would need to be an administrator that would be, in a sense, like a moderator passing the technical control of the video feed from the live testimony person to the next person, as well as if there's any communication coming from the council side. So there's initial setup that's required from each for each meeting, as well as actually for that staff person to be present during the actual testimony taking place. So for that reason, uh, we would require an additional two positions that we're requesting as part-time staff as student workers for a total of 34800 And so new funding would need to be identified, and ITA has recommended that we would work with CAO and CLA if it's the desire to council to do so. Okay. Not this is that this is necessarily a personnel-related concern, but uh, one of the committees that is looking at this probably should look at the the issue of risk, because uh, I know the city has already lost a certain amount of money dealing with uh, you know, some of our speakers and inappropriate behavior, and then lawsuits afterwards, etc. Um, it's it's even easier to envision inappropriate behavior from a remote 
location in people's homes and offices um, and how we respond to that and then what risk we're responding to if there is you know, a variety of potential even more inappropriate behavior than we've seen in, in council chambers. So uh, I wonder if we've looked at that at all, if the city attorney has taken a look at that. If not, uh, maybe we should ask that they be engaged in this issue, uh, maybe at rules committee. We can ask them to respond to that. Um, we've asked them more from the Brown Act perspective. We have considered that there could possibly be inappropriate behavior. One of the things that Google Hangouts allows the administrator to do is to discontinue the feed or to kick the person out just by disconnecting. Um, but that still wouldn't remove all risk because if that person didn't do it in front of the um, administrator, they could, you know, certainly do something as a live feed. And certainly when they're, they're shut down, that is when the, the legal risk occurs. Um, we're making a judgment call on, on where that is. And right. the, so you know, the question is, the where, 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 where does that go? I mean, we can imagine a variety of sure. in, inappropriate behaviors that would, would occur. So you know, where do we draw the line? Um, are we creating a, a, a greater invitation to risk? Um, obviously, the technology is great, and uh, you know it's an easier way to involve people, but it's also an e easier way for us to get into trouble making judgment calls that sure. are costly to the city. So uh, I, I would would certainly ask that we pass on that concern to uh, sure. committees that take this up. Absolutely. After us, but from a technical standpoint, it sounds like a, a, a very workable idea. So I think we just need to think through all the unattended consequences of, of that potentially. Any other comments? Yes. Could, could a delay be built in that the administrator could monitor? Uh, that's something that we'll need to look at. I know that there is a slight delay in the video feed, but uh, it's not a significant one. So that would be something that we would have to talk to Google about. Um, I don't know that they have that set up as just a off-the-shelf available option for their uh, video testimony solution, but that's something that we can inquire into. And to our chair's point, that could get us into sort of censorship, First Amendment rights territory that could be kind of tricky. So that would be a good sort of uh, legal counsel to get as well, I would think. Absolutely. So without uh, any further comment, what I would suggest is that uh, we forward this without a recommendation and with a request to uh, look into these concerns at committees to, uh, that, that review this along the way. Thank you. And with, that will be the order without objection. And with no further business before us, we are adjourned.